Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, 26,000 light years from the centre of our galaxy, in one of the outer reaches of the Milky Way, is an unremarkable little star. Astronomers describe it as a G-type main sequence star, and in most respects there's nothing interesting or unusual about it, but ever since humanity first walked on the planet, it's been an object of fascination. For one very good reason, it's the sun, our sun. The sun's been burning for four and a half billion years, and it's the source of all our energy. <clears throat> At its core, nuclear reactions of almost unimaginable power generate heat and light, which takes 100,000 years to penetrate the surface, but then only another eight minutes to reach us on Earth. The greatest minds have been studying our nearest star for millennia, but only in recent decades have we begun to have some inkling of the astonishing processes at work inside it. With me to discuss the signs of the sun are Carolyn Crawford, Gresham Professor of Astronomy and Fellow of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, Yvonne Ellsworth, Pointing Professor of Physics at the University of Birmingham, and Louise Harrah, Professor of Solar Physics at the UCL Mullard Space Science Laboratory. Carolyn Crawford, let's start with the basics. What Would you give us a quick idea of the size, nature, sun? Well, as you say, it's a star, our nearest star, which we view from the relatively close vantage point of 150 million kilometres away. So this is astronomically speaking, of course. And it's huge. It's got a diameter of 1.4 million kilometres, which translates to about 110 times the width of the Earth. And its volume's so large, you could fit over a million planet Earths within it. So this is why it dominates our solar system. It's incredibly massive. If you added up all the planets, dwarf planets, moons, comets, asteroids within our solar system, it's still 700 times more massive than all the rest of the solar system put together. So its gravity dominates, it sits at the sol centre of the solar system and pulls everything else in orbit around it. Um, other things to say, well, it's if you work out from that mass and that volume, you find that its average density is quite low, so it's less than a quarter of the density of the Earth, so it's not made from the same material. It's mostly gaseous, and it's incredibly hot. Temperatures ranging from over 15 million degrees at the core up to just short of 6,000 degrees on the surface. And so it is, you know, incredible privilege to be able to see a star at such close quarters. Can you tell us about how it came into existence? How and when? Well... This is conjecture from what we know about the laws of physics, but also from observing other stars that are forming within our own galaxy, within the, the spiral arms. And we reckon it came into being about four and a half billion, so that's four and a half thousand million years ago. And all stars form from the material that lies in what we call the interstellar medium. So this is the space between the stars. It's not truly a vacuum. There is material in there. And most of this interstellar medium is transparent to our eyes, is either very cold or very hot. And in regions where you maybe get colder, denser pockets of gas of the interstellar medium, it starts to collapse under gravity. Now, this is grossly simplifying, but of course, the interstellar medium is not uniform. There are areas which are colder, denser than the others. And if you get regions that are just slightly more massive than, you know, slightly denser, they've got slightly more mass, they're going to have more gravity, they're going to pull in more material close to them. They'll get more massive, more gravity, they'll pull in more material, and you get a process of runaway gravitational collapse. So to be even grosser than you, which was easy for me to do because I know about one millionth time what you do, it's a lot of dust coming together and it, it achieves a sort of mass which begins to follow laws of gravity. That's right. And it's not just gas, it's also dust. I mean, this stuff in the interstellar medium, some of it's primordial, some of it is material that has been processed through stars. But you're right, it begins to collapse down and it forms a sort of cocoon. And the thing about... You know, by conservation of energy, if material falls under gravity, it heats up. So right at the densest core of this cloud, it, the material is going to heat up, it's going to get more compressed, and eventually it'll reach temperatures of, you know, sort of 18, 16 million degrees. And at that point, it becomes a protostar because it's hot enough and it's dense enough for that process of nuclear fusion to begin. And at that point, you've got the young star just starting. Louise Hara, would you tell us something of the composition of the sun and what it consists of sorry about that triple question and how we know how we know what you how you got to know what, what you're going to tell us um, as Carolyn said the sun is basically it's just a big ball of gas um, and we measure it it's made mostly of hydrogen 
So it's roughly 90% hydrogen. It's so maybe 8% helium. And the rest of it's made up of things like iron, carbon, oxygen, nickel, just very small amounts of that are up here and that. Um, we can measure it in different ways. The way we, we know what's in the sun is we can use um, spectroscopy. And that's basically dispersing light in different ways so you can, you can measure different energies in the light. Can you just be more specific about that? It's as if you're what do looking... You do? Um, when you've got a rainbow, a rainbow is created by dispersing the light through raindrops. So what you're doing when you're, you're trying to observe the sun and measure its composition is you're doing exactly the same thing and you're able to pick up the chemical elements. It's like a fingerprint on the sun, so you can pick up those different elements there. Um, so helium, for example, was first discovered on the sun and that's why it's called helium because it was named Helios after the Greek sun god. So it was discovered on the sun before we discovered it in the earth. Um, so we can we can tell a lot from spectroscopy, and that's how we know what the abundance is of different elements. So we've got hydrogen, helium, and and about eight percent of other bits. One percent of other bits. One percent. It's ninety nine percent hydrogen, really? helium. Yeah. yeah. And what does the one percent of other bits bring to the pet bring to the table? It makes it easy for us to probe the sun. So you, that's you've got what these you call metal, but we wouldn't call it carbon. Yeah, it's very, it's very yeah. highly ionized, so it's, it's, yeah. it's acting as a gas, basically. So although you've got, you've got these, what we view off as metals, they're so hot and the density is so low that they behave quite differently. And now we on, we'll come back to the latest research later, but just to get a taste of it, are we getting a, a, a new uh, instruments and so on, microscope, um, telescopes, getting us nearer and nearer to know more and more about it? Definitely. Are we finding out a lot in a short time? Yes, we've got a lot of um, spacecraft that are observing the sun. We've got telescopes on Earth that are observing it. Um, and those allow us to, to look at it in really, really fine detail. And as Carolyn said, it's, it's our nearest star. It's our, it's our star that gives us heat and light. And we, we've got the privilege to be able to observe it in detail. We can't do that in any other star. So it allows us to see physical processes in a way we can't do any other way. Do you think it's like other stars? So by studying the sun, you think, ah, oh, this is what stars are like. Is, it, is there such a thing as a typical star? And if so, is the sun a typical star? The sun is, a, well, it's actually quite a boring star, really. You keep <laughs> using the word boring. It's in your notes now. And I thought, well, you know, damn it. It's, it's not boring for us, is it, really? It's definitely not boring for us. And the, the, you know, there's a lot of activity in the sun. You get a lot of dramatic explosions on the sun that seem big. Yeah, for but us. is it like other stars? It's an average star, so it's kind of halfway through its lifetime. Um, there's a lot of stars. It, it lies on what's known as the main sequence that you described in the introduction, and that's where 90% of the stars lie on that main sequence, and that's where stars um, behave when they are converting hydrogen to helium. If the gravity isn't big enough to, to heat it up enough so that it can't produce fusion, can't get that energy, um, then they, they haven't started uh, creating the energy yet. So the sun's in the main sequence yes. phase. Um, it's about, four, it's, we started four and a half billion, billion years, ago. and you think it's got about five and a half billion years to run. Something like so that, yes. what, can you just say again what you mean by main sequence? It simply means that that is the... Um, Lifetime of the lifetime of the star in which is creating helium from hydrogen. So it's using that fusion process to produce all the energy that we eventually see as light coming from the sun. Thank you, Yvonne Ellsworth. We, we, we've got we're getting into detail, but I'd, I'd like to have more about the structure of the sun. Can you, if we look, say we could? I know it's all gas, right? And it wobbles all the time, but still. <laughs> so you could slice it into like an apple. What would you see? OK, it's an interesting concept, taking a knife to the sun, considering it's so hot and you'd melt it, but <laughs> let's put that to one side. Um, OK, in the centre, you have a core, and the core, as we've already described, is where the nuclear processes happen that um, create the energy. How big is the core? 10, 20% of the radius of the sun. Um, uh, I tend to think in terms of what fraction of a radius it is, right. rather than remembering all these terribly big numbers. I think, well, OK, it's about 10, 20% and so on. So that's, that's the core. And then you get into a zone which is quiet. It's very hot. Um, gases are moving around a lot. Light you doesn't travel very far. You didn't tell me nothing about far. the core, though. What, what, what's, happened, what's really going on in the core? Um, OK, you have lots of hydrogen, 
and a rather smaller amount of helium, and those are the things that absolutely dominate there, even though the the metals are still around. Um, so um, the temperature is such and the pressure is such, density is such, that you can turn hydrogen into helium and in so doing release a small amount of energy. So the famous Einstein's law allows you to say how much energy comes out for a certain loss of mass. So, I don't know, 1% of the mass gets lost in the process and comes out as energy. The key thing to note, though, is that unlike in a, a bomb that goes off in a very... Um, well, explosive is probably obvious, but uh, very quickly, some of these reactions actually are not very likely. So the whole thing happens in a very slow and controlled way, thereby allowing the sun to have this enormous um, lifetime, sort of 10 billion years or whatever. So uh, what's slow in terms of the sun? Um, there is are it 100,000 years? It's... 100, well... Uh, 100,000 years is slow because I mean, that's the yes. time it takes for this random walk to get the light out. Um, but there's a relatively small chance of the second stage of the fusion. So the fusion will start by putting two protons together, two hydrogen nuclei together. And then it's got to meet something else before it can progress. And that's actually relatively unlikely. So uh, it probably just decays back again to the protons before it gets there. So this happens in a very controlled way. So you've got the core, then we yeah. move out. We move out into a so-called radiative zone. Radiative, yes. Yeah, because radiation yeah. is what dominates there. Does much happen there? Um, no, it's fairly quiet. Um, the temperature is it's steadily dropping. It's on Sundays, dropping. is on the sun. Or... Yeah, yeah, OK, it's Sunday. So the right, temperature is dropping. Right, let's go on with radiative. <laughs> <laughs> the, the temperature is dropping steadily because the... Um, high energy photons, the light is interacting all the time and every time it has an interaction with a bit of the material it comes out a bit a little cooler so it's a quietish zone but the temperature is steadily dropping as you move away from the nuclear reactions in the core Is there any sense in which the core is changing from the time it became the sun that we that we know? Uh, is it growing bigger? Is it growing smaller? Is it going to be more active? Is it less active? Is it less reliable, and so on and so forth. Has it been a steady state for the last uh, four and a half billion years? No. No. Um, there are several ways in which you can say it's not in a steady state. First of all, clearly, it's using up its fuel. Right? The amount of hydrogen is dropping, and therefore the actual distribution of the temperatures is slightly different. Um, and the size in which the nuclear reaction is happening, the volume in which it's happening, is actually changing. Um, interestingly... Um, the young sun that Carolyn was talking about when it was first formed was only about 70% as luminous, as bright as the current sun. And that has implications for what we know about what happens on Earth. Because if there's less light coming out, we, have, we receive less light. And therefore, you know, there's a whole topic there. Um, so the sun's getting a bit brighter as it ages. Um, and the distribution of the fusion inside is changing slightly. But on a grand scale, no, it's a very stable time. Carolyn, Carolyn Crawford, so we've got out of the core, we've touched on the radiative zone. Can you tell us a bit more about that and then go to the next zone, if we're seeing it as layers, which is quite useful, I hope, uh, the convection zone. What happens there? It'd be the radiative and the convection zones. Right, so as Yvonne's described, you've got the problem that all the energy is produced right in the core. That's the only place it's hot and dense enough to do this nuclear fusion. You've then got to get that energy out through the rest of the star to the surface so it can be escape away into space and travel towards us. And beyond the core, you have, as we've just talked about, the radiative zone, where the energy travels almost like a, a, pass, a slow pass the parcel between all the different particles in the gas, passing on the photons of energy... And that is efficient out to probably so carrying on the idea of sort of fractions of distance out from the sun, out to about seven-tenths of the sun's radius. But at that point, the, the, the gas of the sun has cooled down enough that it's now in the form of atoms. And the thing about atoms is they're much more efficient about absorbing energy. It's like the past the parcel stops and they sit there and they hog the parcel. And the gas heats up. And you can no longer move the energy on in that way. And instead, you have what's called a convection zone. And this is where you build up circulatory currents. It's a vertical rising of, of hot kind of gas. It reaches the surface, cools, and then it sinks back down. And it's very similar to what you might observe if you're watching water boil in a pan. You're transferring the heat from the, the bottom of the pan up to the cooler surface. So it's physical eddies of gas that are rising 
and then reaching the surface and sinking back down again. And that is a mechanical way of transporting the heat energy up to the surface where it can then be radiated away. So we're getting near to what could be called the surface, are we? Yes. Are we? Louise, how are we? So the next, uh, we, right, the next zone is like the thigh bones connected to the... <laughs> anyway, never mind. The next zone is known as the photosphere, and it's the surface of the sun that we can see from the Earth. Can you tell us about the photosphere and what you insist on calling this boring star? I'm finding it fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the photosphere, as you say, is what is the first chance we get to see um, what's going on in the sun. And there are two main things that we can tell from the photosphere. The first is if you look at it in detail, um, you'll see these wonderful confection cells. So Carolyn has described the confection process. We see evidence of it in the surface. So you see these convective cells where the plasma is coming up and then it's falling back and cooling. The scale sizes are small in the sun, but for us, a sort of small convection cell would be maybe a thousand kilometres, so between Land's End and John O'Groats kind of distance. Um, then you have different size scales of that convection because it, it's so complex. what's happening there? The plasma is being, is being brought up, um, it cools, it falls back down again. It's very chaotic and that will allow the creation of magnetic field to occur as well because you've got these um, electrons being moved around and if you've, if you've got a if you cycle at all and you use a, a bike light and you've got a dynamo on it it's the same kind of process as working there so a dynamo creates magnetic field you can get um, the other feature that you'll see in the sun are sunspots so at the minute we're close to solar maximum activity so there are sunspots around, and those will look like blemishes on the surface. So they'll they look like, that's why they're called spots, they'll look like spots um, on the sun's surface. And you can see those today, um, that there are these spots. And those, the reason why they look dark is because they're very, very strong magnetic field, um, and that holds back the convection. So it holds back the plasma from coming up. And th those are the regions where a lot of activity comes from. So those are regions we're really interested in. But if you, if you look at the surface and you analyse the sunspots, the other quirky thing about the sun is that it rotates differentially. So it rotates faster at the equator than at the poles. Because it's a big ball of gas, it has this weird way of rotating, and you can measure that through measuring the sunspots. So it goes faster around the middle than it does at the top yeah. and the bottom. Yeah, which would be hard to imagine on the Earth. It is, isn't it? <laughs> it's like some crazy sort of dance, yeah. really, isn't it? So you've, you've got that happening, and you've got the convection. It's churning all the time. It's moving weirdly all the time, and that, that drives a lot of the activity that we see on it. But the photosphere is what people have been observing for quite a while, is mm. that right? Yes. Yes. For how long a while? I mean, since before Galileo or since Galileo and Kepler? The most observations have been made since the development of the telescope where you can actually observe the sunspots consistently. So they've, they've been observed for hundreds of years, which has allowed us to observe this uh, cyclic behaviour that we see. So Yvonne, since we, you talked about the core, we've clawed our way up from the core to radiative, to radiative, to convection, to the photosphere... Is there any further to go? Oh, yes, and oh, that's... Um, Louise would say this is the bit that's not boring. <laughs> <laughs> I might... You're stuck with that. I is can, it awful? I can work with that. <laughs> um, OK, so I was saying how the temperature just steadily drops and it gets cooler and cooler and it gets to the surface, which is at sort of just under 6,000 degrees. And then suddenly something strange happens. Um, the temperature starts to go up again. Totally counterintuitive. So you have a region known as the chromosphere where this sort of transition happens, called chromosphere because it's coloured and people can see it at eclipses where the majority of the sun is covered but you can see this thin outer layer and it's sort of pinkish which is actually a colour associated with hydrogen. Um, and then beyond it is what's called the corona which is incredibly hot, so back up to a million degrees or so more. So what's happened? Energy has been put in, I guess is the obvious statement. I mean, you don't quite know that when you say it, guess. Um, no, it's a physical principle, energy must have been put in, and therefore what one seeks is the energy. The current thinking is that this comes from the magnetic fields that Louise mentioned, and when they um, north and south cross, they neutralise each other and throw off a lot of energy. Um, there are other methods put forward, 
um, some of which we may discuss later, like sound actually can be important. But in general, I think the current thinking is that it is the magnetic fields that cause this rise in temperature. And then we don't actually run out of the sun. It just gets thinner and thinner, less and less and less dense as you get further away. And it then becomes a matter of definition as to when you say you've left the sun. Yes, the corona, that is a powerful part of it, isn't it? Because that's what sort of beams the stuff to us. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that's the um, areas where matter can actually escape and produce the um, the solar wind, as it's called. Well, can you, can Caroline, can you take it up there and tell us a bit more about this magnetic field which seems to come in at the, uh, on the last lap and, uh, and speed up the race? In the last 100 yards, what's going on? With, you, you've described it, of course you have, but I'd like if you could do it more for somebody like me who didn't, who got it but would like more. Well, you have to think of the sun as how... I mean, the whole of the sun has a very strong magnetic field and it looks... Where it erupts from the surface, it's, it's kind of like your standard bar magnet that you may remember sort of playing with in physics at school and it's got a north pole and a south pole and then you get magnetic field lines joining the two. But the magnetic field traces all through the sun and escapes out into space. So first of all, the magnetic field is generated, as Louis says, by a dynamo. You have some residual magnetic field within the sun, maybe from that cloud that collapsed from the interstellar medium. You have electric charges in the sort of the plasma, the hot gas that's the sun. As they move through the magnetic field, you generate electric current, which in turn amplifies the magnetic field. So you have a case of the, this magnetic field is continually regenerated by the motions within the star, somewhere we think between the radiative and the convective zone. So that's your global magnetic field. And when it escapes the sun, it also pulls some of this ionized gas with it. So Yvonne was talking about the corona. That is where the sort of atmosphere of the sun no longer is a sort of nice round shell, but it, you've got material pulled into long streams. It's such low density gas that it's it's kind of follows the magnetic field lines and is traced by them. But you have this global magnetic field, which is incredibly strong, much stronger than you get at the Earth. But again, with magnetic fields, they're a fantastic way of storing energy. You can kind of pull them, compress them, you can stretch them, you can tangle them. And in the same way, you can sort of stretch or compress a spring or a magne uh, rubber band. You can store energy in it, and then when you release that, it goes back to a natural configuration, and you get a huge input of energy. Like pressing a spring down, taking your hand yeah. off, and it goes... Whoop. Or stretching yeah. your, your, your elastic band and then letting it go. So there are ways which magnetic fields will reconfigure to much, uh, much kind of uh, simpler configurations, and then it releases all that energy in one go. And a lot of this is what powers some of the extreme behaviour we see in the sun. And also whether you get that sort of localised twisting, you know, from rotation of the sun, from this vertical motion with the convective currents, that's where you get the kinks and the knots, and that's where the exciting stuff, such as the sunspots and the sort of real localised activity on the sun's surface builds up. Do you want to come in? I saw you making a note. Um, no, 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 no. I was just thinking that um, the, the concept of elastic bands is actually really good. Um, because the, the magnetic field does get moved around and stretched and and then sort of releases all that energy. And there are the big scale that you were talking about, uh, but there's also... Uh, it all happens on a tiny scale as well, sort of so-called micro flares. So um, there's a constant little niggle of energy in, as well as these great big outbursts that, that we see. Um, so it's... It happens on very many scales, which is one of the really interesting things about it. Well, let's continue this. Lewis Hara, the sun's magnetic fields, as we've heard, but it's, it's, re it's, re it's responsible for a number of phenomena. Can we talk about, which can be seen from Earth, can we talk about sunspots and flares? First of all, can you, you are, you've mentioned sunspots yes. already, but just say a bit more about them and then flares, please. We can see Sunspots these. are, as was mentioned, the sort of dark blemishes that you can see in the photosphere. And they are regions of very strong magnetic fields. So the, the strength would be sort of thousands of times higher than the Earth's magnetic field, for example. So they're, they're strong. Um, the, the magnetic field will be complex. You'll have magnetic field emerging in from below and whacking into it, and it will rotate and it will turn, and it will create the energy that Carolyn has described. And that energy will be... Is, is known as a flare, so it's releasing fast amounts of energy very, very quickly in minutes. Um, and that will, we can measure that in different ways, the electromagnetic radiation, 
will will reach us within minutes um, that can heat up the Earth's atmosphere. Um, particles will be released as well. The field lines will es essentially just squeeze the particles, so we'll jet them outwards. So you will get that effect too. You also get associated sometimes with flares coronal mass ejections. So you'll get a lot of material being ejected out um, into the heliosphere, and that will that can reach us too. And that will take a few days to get to us if it's Earth directed. So there's a lot of different ways that energy can be released through the magnetic fields. Is there any sense in which, in the time you've ab been able to record this in more detail, you've seen significant changes in the behaviour, let's call it, of the sun? The sun has uh, activity cycles. Um, so we roughly have an 11-year cycle. And during the space age, if you like, um, where we've been able to observe the sun in detail, the activity level has started to decrease so that activity has dropped a little bit so it would go through these um, short term cycles and then longer term cycles as well Imran, can you go into the cycles in a bit more detail? Yeah, there have been um, sunspots on the sun is a very obvious measure of um, the magnetic field and what you see is that at times, as Louise has said, there are lots of sunspots and we've just well, we're just going through maximum at the moment, so there's lots of spots on the sun. And then we go into a phase where there's no spots on the sun, and then the spots come back and they build up and they go away and it keeps on repeating. And that's due to the magnetic field being actually created and then destroyed, which is quite a neat concept. Um, so at, at times it's like a bar magnet, as Carolyn said. But why does it do it so regularly? Between sort of 8 and 15 years it gets created and then destroyed. What, it seems to, what's the internal mechanism that makes it do that with so, like a clock? Um, do you want to become a physicist who deals in how the sun works as a magnetic <laughs> field? People disagree about it. Um, it's not really understood. Um, nobody can actually produce the periodicity without putting something else right. in that sort of forces it out. So um, it's something that those who model magnetic fields would really like to understand, but we don't. And as Louise has said, it's not only just that there's this uh, roughly 11-year cycle, but there are longer-term cycles. So there's um, a cycle that's around 100 years. So um, the maximum we've just gone through is actually pathetic, in the uh, grand scheme of things. You certainly talk up your subject. Like, <laughs> oh, I have no, to say, you big it up like anything. <laughs> it's such fun that it's pathetic because... Of course it is, yeah. um, There have been times in the past when the sunspots all disappeared. You talked about Galileo at the beginning. Just around the time when Galileo was getting himself into trouble for talking about sunspots, the sun went through a, pay, a phase where it had very little in the way of activity on its surface. And... Associated with that were um, was, dra was really cold weather in northern Europe, um, famine, social unrest, all sorts of other things. So actually, um, given that we've gone into a period where the sun is getting quite quiet, um, we'd really like to understand what's going on. Um, if it were just repeating regular as clockwork, then... Um, I'd declare it much more boring. I think it's really quite fascinating that it's gone into this quiet We want to draw boring. We've given, her enough, <laughs> we've given her enough grief for that, fine. It's absolutely... Um, so, OK, so the sun now is roughly like it was 100 years ago in terms of its activity level, about half what it was a couple of cycles ago at the maximum. And the previous minimum was very quiet, very spot-free, very long. Um, some of the indices that we use to actually measure activity went to levels that we've never seen before. But egotistic humankind, which is listening to this program, <laughs> including me, I'm listening, they want to know what effects this solar activity has on us. And that can be major. Yes. OK, it's low probability but high consequence events. If one of these coronal mass ejections, so as Louise has described, if the sun gives out an enormous eruption of gas and this you've got this large sort of bubble of you know hot gas and all the magnetic fields associated with that travels through the solar system and if that hits the earth head on you have what's known as geom geomagnetic storm the magnetic field within this plasma will interact with the magnetic field of the earth there's rapidly changing magnetic fields 
And it can induce enormous electric currents here on Earth that can be could potentially be quite catastrophic. Now, we have had examples of this actually occurring in March 1989. There was a geomagnetic storm where some of these induced electric currents chose to travel through power lines instead of through the ground and sort of took out uh, the uh, power grid in Quebec for about nine hours. There have been other examples just two years ago, enormous clouds of plasma that just missed the Earth by about nine days. They moved through the place where Earth had been just nine days previously. What would have happened if it had hit Earth? Well, first of all, you're going to the satellites that are just outside the atmosphere are going to be quite vulnerable. There's very sensitive electronics could get damaged, both by the radiation and the cloud of plasma. You have the potential disruption to the, the power grids, which is one of the major things. And if it really hit with no notice and damaged the grids, it could be millions, probably billions worth of pounds of damage and take a while to recover from. So that's the sort of, as I say, low probability but that's the kind of event we want to um, we want to be able to predict and avoid and probably the best example of you know the danger that the, the such events can bring actually dates from about 150 years ago there was an event called the it's called the Carrington event it happened in 1859 where a British solar astronomer Richard Carrington was actually looking at the sun he was doing all these daily measurements of sunspots that Yvonne's described tracking the activity of the sun and he saw a couple of bright flashes of light on the sun which then faded over the period of a minute and you know this was very exciting to see something happen on the sun which you know it changed on such a small time scale hadn't been seen before but the consequence was that 12 hours later you had one of these geomagnetic magnetic storms where this huge bubble of gas had reached um the magnetic field of earth there were aurora all round the skies that's another indication of when uh, that you get an interaction between the solar wind and the plasma from the sun reaching the earth bright enough that apparently you could read newspapers by them and normally you see this just in so northern polar and southern polar latitudes. This was going down as far south as Bermuda and Hawaii. Again, if the if you see them far south, it's a, an intense storm, and the electric currents would travel along uh, telegraph lines. So you have stories of telegraph operators who, unfortunately, some got shocked. Some telegraph officers were set on fire by these currents, but they could also it disrupted the telegraph lines in some cases. In other cases, they disconnected the batteries and found the telegraph lines were working better than ever with these electric currents from the storm. So you have these huge effects from the storm that long ago. You can just see that if a similar event hit us now, we're much more vulnerable to this kind of electrical disruption. Can you tell us, <coughs> Louise, can you tell us something about the solar wind? The solar wind is something we've sort of touched on a little already, but it's it's always there. We have a wind coming from the sun all the time. Um, the speeds are large. They range from a few hundred kilometres per second to around 2,000 kilometres per second. So that's, you know, 100 times the speed of a transatlantic passenger plane. So they're, they're fast. Um, it's basically electrons, protons, magnetic fields being sent out into the solar system um, we've talked about the effect on us, but they, they affect all the other planets. So they've, it's been measured at Venus, at Mars, at Jupiter, at Saturn, and it's even been measured by Voyager, which is now at the edge of the solar system. So the solar wind is strong enough to, to go for extremely long distances. It is variable, um, and it does have an impact. So even the slower slower winds, the less dramatic winds, coming from features that are known as corona holes, and that's basically a hole in the solar atmosphere that allows stuff to get out quickly. When those appear, those will have speeds of 800 kilometres per second and they'll be steady and they'll just keep on churning um, and those can have a big effect as well. Will well. they have an effect here? On they'll have a, an effect and something like that can have an effect on spacecraft. So as we were talking about already, I think we're so reliant on spacecraft and well, I use spacecraft every day. I'm sure when you buy something in the shop with your debit card or anything like that, we're all using spacecraft to communicate. So we're much more reliant on things like that now. When you're travelling in an airline, you know, routes have to be diverted, transatlantic routes or polar routes are diverted because um, of lack of radio communication. So we're, we're affected more and more because we're so reliant on these technologies.
Yvonne Ellsworth, you mentioned earlier on that the the the, the, uh, the importance of sound waves, which are now involved. Can you develop that? Yes, absolutely. Um, we've talked about convection and the fact that you can see. Um, the convection process material moving if you boil a pan. Um, I'd sort of carry that on and think, OK, if you boil a kettle, how do you know when you're about to get your cup of tea? Well, the answer is you can hear it. The kettle starts to make a noise. The water moving becomes noisy. So if you have convection associated with that, you have noise, which is sound. And unexpectedly people discovered that uh, the sound that we all expected to be generated in the sun actually tra can travel through the sun. So it doesn't get um, destroyed and just confused in the local region where it's produced, but it actually can travel. And it can travel right through the volume of the sun and set up resonances like a musical instrument in, inside the sun. So... We have this sun where we've talked about all these local phenomena on it. We've talked about sunspots and flares and all sorts of things. But you can also think of it as a big spherical body that gently breathes with a period of about five minutes as the sound waves propagate through it and cause the surface to move just a little bit. And that just a little bit enables us to actually observe rather than conjecture what's inside. Astonishing, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Um, right, let's... Caroline, um, we, we've been able to see the suns from space in the last few decades. What's that brought to the information centre, which you three are? <laughs> well, we've talked about sort of the outer layers of the sun, the corona. That The gas there is at temperatures of like two to three million degrees. It's very faint, invisible light. You can observe it very clearly using X-rays and you can't observe X-rays from the surface of the Earth. So if you want to look at the sun in bands like X-rays, ultraviolet, where there's lots of energetic activity going on within the flares, within the corona, you really need to do that from a satellite. And the other thing about a satellite, of course, is that it gives you a different vantage point uh, from just being on Earth or around Earth. You can move satellites. For example, we've got a couple called Stereo, one that's just ahead of... Earth in the orbit, one that's just behind Earth in the orbit, and they give us a much more three-dimensional view of some of these mass ejections and especially how they might impact Earth. So again, it's the external viewpoint as well as the different wave bands. Okay, so <laughs> Carolyn's passed Caroline's out over pointing to me. You, so <laughs> yeah, I need, I need to point you. Obviously, um, you would pick up the battle. So we have we have stereo as Carolyn describes. So they are um, they've allowed us for the first time to get a 360 degree view of the sun so um, I suppose like every small child who's curious you want to see behind things, you want to look down on them etc if you get that 360 degree view then you can know that there's a nasty big complex sunspot that's about to come around, we want to know whether it's likely to erupt or produce one of these explosions so we've got a better view of that with stereo the other missions that we use are um, Hanode which is a UK, Japanese, US mission, which is basically like a microscope, so it's looking at the detailed physical processes. Um, we have the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which um, allows you to have continuous monitoring, which is another really useful thing about being in space. If you're on, on the ground, you've got night time and you've got weather effects um, that you can't really avoid, but being in space, you, you avoid all that. So the continuous monitoring allows us to observe all those dramatic changes that are happening. Yeah, and I'd like to follow up on the concept of seeing what's coming round, what big um, active region or flare or whatever might, might be coming your way. Um, the magnetic fields, the sunspots and so on, actually influence the sound waves. And it is actually possible to image through to the backside of the sun um, and see that there is an active region forming on the backside and as the sun rotates in about 26 days, so you get five, ten days' notice about this object coming around. And it's routine monitoring now. Um, it's done from one of the satellites that Louise mentioned, um, STO. It's also done from the ground. Um, so it's all geared to trying to make sure that we know what's about to happen and are not caught unawares. What are the, you're working on this, right? The, what is the, what are the most... Briefly, I'm afraid, sorry. What, what are the most significant current developments in study of the sun? 
Understanding the details of the magnetic field, I think, is the biggest thing because the, the different instrumentation we have have allowed us to see the twisting, see the shearing, measure that quantitatively, be able to understand what what will trigger um, a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection. So to, to get a grasp of that, the, the physical concepts around that, we've been able to do that recently. Is this new stuff, Carolyn, is this new information that's being pulled in, is it changing uh, significantly uh, views of the sun, say, 50, 100 years ago, from 50, 100 years ago? Yes, because we're, we're understanding from the helioseismology that Yvonne's described the actual structure inside the sun, and we're understanding the, the actual processes about the flares being produced and the things that you know, can have an effect on, on us here on Earth. We're beginning to not just understand them, but hopefully one day actually begin to predict from this monitoring to know in advance when and where a flare might occur, hopefully also how strong it might be, and start to do also that longer-range forecasting with the, the solar cycles that we've mentioned. So and all of this is now within our grasp. We're not there yet, but this is part of what we're all driving towards. Uh. Anybody, but start with Yvonne. We, we know that we've been told the sun's been around for four and a half billion or so years. How much longer has it got to go? In Will it, it see us out? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, can be rest, you can rest assured on that. Yeah, um, in terms of its current lifestyle, yeah. it's here for as long again. All right, so we're about halfway through. Um, and then it becomes a different sort of star. It becomes a giant star, and that's probably curtains for us, actually. Um, it'll get a bit warm, a bit toasty, um, and we'll get enveloped in the sun and it won't be nice. Um, but you were asking what the developments are. The, uh, the other thing I would chip in is um, we're now starting to study other stars through their interior sound waves, and that helps me answer your question. Very good. And that helps me come to the end of the programme. Thank you very much to Carolyn Crawford. Louise Hara and Yvonne Ellsworth. Um, that's the last in this current series of In Our Time. We'll be back on September the 25th. Thank you very much for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for that last point about the other stars. I completely went from that. And I'm <laughs> glad, so glad you pulled that out of me. Uh, well, I wanted to get it in because it no, no, was so interesting. That the was the first thing I thought. And I was like, oh no, I'll start close to home and then work out to the rest of the stars. And by the time I got there, it had gone. So the stars had gone. Right. <laughs> that's that's right. the other thing we were talking about. That the, we keep calling the sun boring, but that's because these other stars produce much bigger flares and bigger coronal mass ejections. Well, the little everything. can be interesting. I mean, you, you sort of proved that. This tiny little sun that we're talking about was sufficient for a fairly packed conversation. We thought our solar system was understood and worked out and everything... It was the paradigm. Mm. But actually, it didn't turn out to be like that. Um, and when we're doing this seismology and other stars, it's actually quite hard to find other stars that are so-called solar twins, just like the sun. Mm. So I wouldn't be surprised to find that if, you know, when you hold this in 10 years' time and ask folks about the sun, that actually it turns out not to be quite as usual and ordinary as we think. So we might, we might be back to the uniqueness of our condition mm. argument. We might be. Yeah. yeah, there's all sorts of... There are selection effects. It, it's actually quite tricky to measure stars like the sun because you know, it's easier to measure nice big giant stars that are bright. Um, but I, you know, I've, I'd be prepared to wager that it might not turn out to be average. So what did we massively miss, Caroline? Caroline, what did we miss? Yeah, I, you know, I think we covered an awful lot of ground. Yeah, it might have been. Didn't quite have enough time for you to expand about the red giant, but you, you yeah. got in there. I got my the eventual tiny demise bit in. <laughs> of the, you know, sort of yeah. after that, that it after the red giant, the centre sinks down to become a sort of a white dwarf. So you've got about half the mass of the sun compressed down to something about the size of the Earth. Yeah, well, I think so. It must be fun to think up names, mustn't it? Who had the fun of thinking up red giant and white dwarf? They'll stick, and we'll always use them. Well, the Do we know that, the person or persons? Uh, yeah. Not always. Sometimes you know people who. You, you know, in, if things have happened more recently, then you do know who's coined the phrase, you know. So it's like Fred Hoyle with the Big Bang, and I can't remember, remember other examples. But the thing is, they're fairly descriptive. You know, dwarf because it's small and white because it's bright, and it 
it's hot and it rages. Away. I mean, never mind. We, 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 we. <laughs> um, there are those who um, argue about the roots of the words. Um, helioseismology is the seismology of the sun, OK, yeah. but it's a mixture of Greek and Latin roots. And there are those who get very upset about that. <laughs> and asteroseismology is the same thing for the stars, but um, I think that is properly... It's slightly your own fault as scientists, isn't it? Because because when you when you started naming things, you gave it you you were you were way behind classical learning in the area of respectability, and so you tried to sort of show you were just as good as them by clicking on Greek words, Roman, if it, a sec, as a second <laughs> uh, from the very beginning. Yeah, isn't that yeah. right? I'm, I think it's a um, it's a good premise. I haven't got the evidence to argue it properly <laughs> with you, but. It's a good premise. I mean, it had the advantage of being of being sort of super vernacular, didn't it? Because if you said "hello," people in Italy would understand it as well yes. as people here. The educated educa people would. So that's a, a serious advantage. Yeah. But, but yeah. sometimes there are nice sort of consequences. So I, I've just been reading in one of the books you recommended about how asteroid means little star. Yeah. And that was coined by William Herschel to do down the discovery. You know, he discovered Uranus. Uh, in 1781 and then it was the turn of the 19th century so the early 1800s the Italian astronomers start to discover the first asteroids they wanted to call them planetoids and he was he really promoted this name asteroid and pushed that they called asteroids to kind of separate them say that you know he's the only one that's discovered a new planet these can't possibly be planetoids and he pushed this name we're stuck which if you think about it doesn't actually make much sense yeah, planetoid is much better planetoid yeah. makes it's much more sense word, though, is it? well it's true yeah <laughs> but he you know he had this dare i say, well it comes across as this idea that perhaps not that generously to they to be described in a more sort of slightly dismissive term, you know, little stars. I think we do tend to be unimaginative these days in terms of what things are called. I mean, like the Sol Orbiter mission. Yes, <laughs> it's called like Sol Orbiter Solar because it's orbiter. going to orbit the sun. It's not. Well, they're not give it a fancy name like the Japanese do. No, when it's that's launched. special to Japan. I think when we. Japanese missions will be named things like Solar A, Solar B, Solar C, <laughs> which is very boring. But after launch and this one successful orbit has occurred, then it's christened, essentially. So you have a no day, which means? So we have a no day, means sunrise. Sunrise. Yoko, the sunbeam. Mm. It's um, much more poetic in a way, it? Is, it is, it's lovely. Yeah, well, enter nice. Tom Morris, producer, with an, a light end of chat. Thank you, and an offer of tea or coffee. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.